So first, first of all, can we just go along the row sort of so you can introduce yourselves and just tell the audience how you're related to the issue of modern slavery and how you're involved in the field? So we'll start with you, Andrew, if that's okay. Good evening. Uh, I'm Andrew Wallace. I'm the CEO of an uh, anti-slavery charity called Unseen that does five things. We work with victims, men, women and children that are identified in the UK. We work with all the blue light agencies, so police, paramedics, border force, etc., advising and training them. We work increasingly with a lot of corporates and companies across the globe around the issue of transparency in supply chains. We work with governments around the world, the devolved governments in the UK and local government uh, advising around policy, legislation and strategy, and we run the UK's Modern Slavery Helpline. And on Tuesdays we rest. Hello, I'm Monique Villa and I run the Thomson Reuters Foundation. And we, 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 since 10 years that I took over the foundation, we have um, taken the problem of slavery from different angles. One is uh, journalism, so we cover what we call the underreported story, and this one is certainly one of the underreported stories, the other being women's rights, uh, human impact of climate change, and, um, and uh, access to property, access to land, which is also a big issue all over the world. And we are distributed on Reuters wire, so it has a, a big impact. Uh, we take it from the rule of law angle, and we have a program called Trust Law, where we have 4,000 NGOs and social enterprise, and um, uh, we give them, when they become member, we vet them all over the world in 175 countries, and when they become member, we take over all their legal needs. So we have 850 law firms uh, working for free for the best NGOs and social entrepreneurs. All the best NGOs in the slavery world, in India, in Pakistan, in Nepal, everywhere are members of Trust Law, and this is a big service that we give them. And then we do this conference every year, which is the Trust Conference. This year it will be on 14 and 15 November. Some of you have come uh, many times there. Uh, and uh, where we take action, and big action, uh, about the slavery and trafficking, like the Stop Slavery Award that I created with Janish Kapoor, that we give to the corporations which are best in class to try to clean their supply chain from forced labor, but many other things too. So voila, in a few words. I'm Elizabeth Butler-Sloss. I'm a former judge. I am an independent member of the House of Lords. I'm co-chairman of the parliamentary group on modern slavery and human trafficking. I was one of those who managed to persuade uh, Theresa May as uh, Home Secretary to bring forward a, a bill on modern slavery, which became law in 2015. And I was on what's called the pre legislative scrutiny. Uh, I have now been asked with Frank Field MP and Maria Miller MP, the three of us, to hold a review of how well the Modern Slavery Act is actually uh, doing and how we could advise on improving it. And we've got to get done, I have to tell you, by March. A lot to do to improve. <laughs> Myself, uh, I am Indian. So this is my culture. Uh, myself, Mansi Pradhan. I come from India, rural India. And uh, I'm working for uh, women, violence against women and modern slavery. The end of modern slavery, the, I want to, I, I want to uh, work for women, only what is modern slavery? Modern slavery, uh, the women is suffer the domestic violence, workplace violence, and industry violence, and uh, rape case violence. So many violence, uh, so many violence uh, for women, and uh, women is suffer not only India in across the world. So, my three NGO, I'm working for my NGO until 82, now continuing, not only India, I want to work for another country and want to peace for women, not 
uh, this is my aim, only my aim is all women, all women release, all women get benefit for the society, like a man. Man and women is a one coin and two sides. So I want to the man honor to women always. In house, in college, in a school, in a road, in industries and small industries, any place, anywhere. The man will honor to women and appreciate the work for women. That's all. Uh, I want to speak something, language difference. I am not a great English speaker. I am come from rural India. Not rural, like a jungle. <laughs> so, uh, excuse me, uh, I want to speak only 10 minutes. So, I, I will. Um, I want to give, give a my brief speech. introduction. Uh, yes. Yeah, just can yeah continue with the introduction. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the Oxford Union. It is indeed great honor to be invited to speak at this historic forum, where such great men and women have once spoken. I am deeply honored by your invitation. As you notice, I am not an English speaker, I am a worker. In fact, the school where I studied learning to speak in English was like dreaming to land in the moon. So, it is indeed an act of courage to invite someone like me who always stood up for what she believed in, not caring for the lack of proficiency in a certain language. Well, the place where I was born and brought up for most of my childhood, I did not have the basic facilities. There was no electricity, no school, no roads also. Hardly. The girls in my village thought about education. There was only a small school with class 6 grade, 14 kilometers away from my village. I walked barefoot to the school and until I was 17 years old, I did not have shoe to wear. All had was a layer of the soil. It was the God gifted shoes to me. As a child, my only desire was to study in that teeny school of my village. That indeed was my Oxford. Not knowing the language, of English well, I have understood and felt the language of pain and emotion deeply. Whether it is my part of the world, of your, the struggle and pain of women is universal. It is just beyond all man-made boundaries. Indeed, as the world suggest these boundaries are sustained by powerful men decades. I stand today to speak of such pain and emotion I have experienced in my life and of others I have associated with. I stand today express helplessness I have seen in the eyes of thousands of my sisters which can never gather the courage to speak for themselves. 
people living enslaved for years and decades. And we ought to hear their stories and must feel their pain and must pull them out from this hell. Therefore, the fight to end modern slavery is whatever from it exists must begin by defeating what modern slavery is. A slave is not always a person with iron chain around her or him. There are millions around the world who carry this chain around them all their lives. It is a very unfortunate that we never see this chain, even, even are ever able to perceive their pain of enslavement. And therefore, a slave is a person who do not have the freedom to live a life of her or his choice. And indeed, we cannot imagine a world free of slavery unless a single woman in the world remains enslaved, tormented, and tortured. Well, we know battling this has not been easy. Let me give you an example, born and birth of in a very orthodox and poor family. With none but my mother being the only friend and guide, I was put into the face of enslavement very early in my life. Young old male female members of not just our family, but the entire village was after me when I urged to move out of the village to study at seven year old. Somehow I crossed that phase thanks to my mother. However, my struggle led me to spirit where I become the only female business entrepreneur in the entire area. I continued with my higher education, completed law and a master in my mother language, Odia. Yes, that was my struggle at the very beginning. I was not just ensuring that my family of six is fed well. I wanted to share my country, my journey with thousand other women that started my real journey with my organization, OISS, and Honor for Women National Campaign, where I promised to stand by very such women who is fighting her own battle, making sure we are united in this struggle, we stand by each other hand in hand. As in many parts of the world, India today has a political system that practice gender inequality in every in very institutionalized form. We see representatives and the very structure of the ruling party, the Bharatiya Janata Party, led by Prime Minister Modi, practicing idea of subduing women breaking voice of those who speak up. The topmost leaders are accused of unacceptable behavior, workplace harassment, and have publicly advocates for rapists. The government advocates Betty Bachao, Betty Padhao, that is protect girl child, and educate girl child. The very idea of protection being problematic. Do we really have to be protected and who will protect us and from whom? Politics protocols to the deepest layer of the society. And when the very elected representatives promote the idea that power is restored, is subduing women, modern slavery is indeed institutionalized. Ms. Pradhan, would you mind if we just come back to the issue of gender 
um, in modern slavery in yeah. two minutes. We just unpack what it means first, just very quickly. Um, but thank you very much, and can we just come back to it? And I will, I will come back to you. Only one minute. One minute, okay. Sorry, this is because, no, no, however strong they are, cannot put an end of the exploitation of women until they are educated and empowered. Only one thing I want to speak, and no measure can end modern slavery until exploitation of women ends. I therefore from the podium call upon all world leaders to urgently initiate setting up a worldwide fund for women at the United Nations to launch a massive drive to educate and economically empower women in country where they are most vulnerable. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. Um, so the term modern slavery, which was just unpacked in one sense there, um, encompasses a vast variety of issues, uh, which can naturally lead to sort of misconceptions about what it actually means. Could we perhaps have a discussion about what it does mean and, and just sort of explain it to the audience? Let's start with you. Mo modern slavery um, is when someone, the definition of a slave is when someone is forced to work under force, coercion, or violence at no pay above subsistence. That's the definition. So many, many kind of cases we think of about slavery um, are, are not really slavery. It could be very low wages, it could be very many different things. But this is the definition. Um, the, the ILO, which is the UN, the International Labour Organization, which is always you know, very low in numbers, have come to a numbers with a uh, World Free Foundation, which is 40.3 million uh, slaves in the world today. Uh, this is, according to many specialists, very, very under the real number. Uh, the business of slavery is a business of $150 billion a year, according to the same ILO, and many things, it's much bigger. And more or less, it's divided 30% in sex trafficking, 70% in forced labor. And both are, it seems, growing. Uh, sex trafficking, because it has become so easy to sell women and children and men online, if you need. Uh, it's very easy. You have many websites specialized in that. Um, and, and it is growing because it is total impunity. Uh, in 2016, so you have 40 million slaves today, according to the ILO, and you had only 9,000 prosecutions in the world. 9,000 for 40 million. So it's almost the, the ideal business. Um, uh, big profit, no, uh, no risk to go to jail, or, or no risk to, 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 so it's total impunity. So this is a situation which makes that um, it, it's very difficult to address because the 70% in forced labor, for instance, and I will speak of later, if you want, of, of examples of people I know very well who are survivors of this, um, of this forced labor. But the people in forced labor, uh, also we are all of us responsible for that because we are consumer. We buy goods without paying attention who has done the goods. And worse than that, the big corporations uh, have uh, 40, 50 years ago started to massively outsource their production because they wanted to have cheaper labor. So to have cheap labor, they went uh, massively in the developing world without paying any attention to what was, ha what was happening in their supply chain and down their supply chain. And of course, if you want f uh, cheap labor, you can finish with forced labor. So this is an equation which is very difficult to address because when today, and, and I guess the Baroness will speak of, of the law uh, that has been voted in the UK, but also you know, in California, in, in, in France now, in Netherlands, in Australia, but when you want to address that and you are a big corporation, it's very difficult to know all your suppliers in the supply chain. So it's, it's a very complicated issue. 
and uh, this law has allowed uh, uh, many corporations to pay attention to the, to the issue. And, uh, but we are still far from any big result. I will take just one example, which is the Stop Slavery Award I mentioned before. So it was created because you cannot say a, a corporation is slave free because no corporation are slavery free. No corporation are slavery free. We all use um, you know, phones which are made with mica, the mica, the biggest producer, the producer of mica in the world is India with 60% of the production. Uh, in the mica mines in India, you have children, slaves who uh, die. Uh, just taking the mica for our cosmetics, for this, for everything. So we are all, in a way, uh, accomplished. This, is, this looks very sad, but indeed we can do something and we, we, we can address it. And as consumer, we should pay attention to what we buy and to, and to really think of it. So we will come back to that later. But just to give the dimension of the issue, the sex trafficking is also a growing business because you see now, uh, warlords of drugs, drug lords, moving into the sex trafficking business because it's so easy and a woman, you can sell her 30 times a day and it's, um, it's relatively easy. Uh, and, and once again, impunity. So if you take all these aspects together and you add this massive thing that is happening today, which is the migrants issue, you cannot today speak of sex trafficking or forced labor without thinking of the refugees everywhere in the world. And the refugee escape situation of, uh, you know, extreme poverty uh, because of um, climate change, because of war, because of economic situation, because of dictatorship, etc. So they, they escape, they leave everything, and they are in incredibly brave to do that. And then they, they are the best prey for traffickers, because traffickers prey on vulnerability. The more vulnerable you are, and the more ready you are to, to fall prey to them. Because as Kevin Bells, who is one of the great men in, in, in the anti-trafficking world, says, there is three words which are magic for anybody who is uh, flying from his country. It's, do you want a job? And then you are ready to take any job and then it can lead you very well and very far. So I'll come back on the, on the survivors and how they survive to that, but it's a massive issue. So you talked a bit about modern slavery in the developing world. Perhaps you could talk about how it manifests itself in the UK, um, Elizabeth? In the uh, UK, um, last year, 5,000 plus were identified as potentially those who had been exploited in one way or another. And exploitation is the basis of this. Um, the, what you were saying, of course, is entirely right, uh, but the phrase that I would use is exploitation. But the police, and we're not talking about sort of starry-eyed people, we're talking about the police, actually think they're in excess of 13,000 um, people in this country who are in fact victims. And at this stage, they're looked at as victims because potentially they will be going through as witnesses in the criminal courts uh, or going through what is called the national re referral mechanism. But what is rather shocking about it, even worse, is that last year, of this 5,000 plus, 41% were children. And one, um, and basically what we're talking about and I think you were talking about, is the numbers that were given are tip of the iceberg. There is a vast amount underlying it. The main areas are, in fact, in addition to prostitution and forced labour, there's domestic servitude. People brought over, particularly from the Middle East, uh, to be employed by individuals or families who are treated as slaves. They sleep on the floor, they aren't allowed out, they aren't paid. There's also benefit fraud. And there are women who are in London with babies in their arms who are not their babies. And they are picking up benefit for the children who are not theirs. And also they are begging with children who are not theirs. 
A lot of them were at one stage in Slough, coming up to Paddington and going down the Edgware Road. And I walked down and saw quite a number of them. They were Romanian Romas. Fortunately, that gang was caught. Uh, but this was begging. Organ donation is another area where people are being offered money, quite small sums of money, 50 to 100 pounds, in order to donate a kidney. And then they are, or they are being taken and made to donate a kidney. One of the real problems at the moment is a new idea in the last two or three years called county lines. And county lines is young children, some of them under 12, who are picked up by um, gangs. They are given drugs and they get on trains and buses because there are too many drugs swilling around Manchester, Liverpool, London, Leeds and so on. And they are going to small rural areas and small towns and villages where they are uh, peddling the drugs. There are what are called um, cuckoo nests, where a lot of these children are taken, where some vulnerable adult or very elderly woman like me, living alone, uh, is entered into by a gang who take over the house. The children live there in appalling conditions and are not then able to leave. The police were prosecuting the children. At long last, the government, the uh, National Crime Agency, realizes that these children are actually slaves and are not, in fact, offenders. But I might also tell you that this country is a country of uh, destination uh, from, among other countries, Albania, China, Vietnam, Nigeria, Sudan, Eritrea, Romania. 116 countries in all have sent people to this country identified as being exploited. Uh, they have also, um, there's, uh, particularly with forced labor, which you were talking about and you were talking about, um, the interesting thing is they target in this country the homeless and the homeless are picked up, offered money, and then are taken off usually to stay in caravans. And when I did an in original inquiry with Frank Field at the request of um, Theresa May, we had evidence from a man who had been homeless taken to Sweden. So we were exporting people to Sweden to work on construction sites. The other thing you need to know is about if any of you have cars or bikes, are you having your cars cleaned and car washes? If you're only being asked to pay five pounds, they will be exploited because it costs a great deal more than five pounds to do it. The other thing is nail bars. There's no shortage of women in nail bars who are actually victims. And so this is where we are at the moment. And um, it's a disturbing picture. And I am part of this team looking at the act to see whether we ought to be improving it. Particular area for improving, I have to tell you, is in relation to um, the chains or in the transparency uh, in the companies. And one of the things that worries us is it's only companies with 36 million turnover or more who are involved. They aren't obliged to say what they're doing. There is no monitoring uh, there, and there is no enforcement. And these are areas that we are now looking at very closely to see what we can advise the government to do. Just touching on what you said there, what can we do uh, as consumers in our day-to-day -day lives to be more aware of the issues of modern slavery and um, be more responsible, I suppose, in tackling it? Look, if you go to a nail bar, does somebody look very depressed? Does somebody just not playing a, a part in it? Mostly uh, in hairdressers, we all know as women, in hairdressers, nail bars and so on, everybody's gossiping. But if it's somebody not doing that, just wonder <laughs> and perhaps ask a question or two. In car washes, as I say, if you only pay five pounds, I would report them to the police. And that's what you do, you report, report someone to the police? I think so. Okay. And, but but, um, but, but there, there are also other ways because car washes, for instance, they, 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 have, been, they have been dismantled, some, some car washes, because these were people who were not paid at all. I mean, it's not the question of uh, how much. Because, you know, there is always this question when you speak of consumer, you think, 
ah, if I buy a t-shirt at two pounds, uh, obviously it has been made by slaves. But could very, you could very well buy a very good cashmere at 500 pounds and it would be made by slaves too. So it's not as simple as that and it's very complicated indeed. But um, yes, look at, the, look at the people who never speak, cannot speak, look afraid, terrorized, beaten, etc. That's always a good sign. In the UK, Elizabeth and Monique have sort of gone global and, and come all the way down to, to a nail bar. But why don't we make this personal? Because actually, if, if we throw these big figures around, it's very easy to become detached from it. So I'm guessing that you all have a mobile phone. Thankfully, you're all wearing clothes and you've all eaten today. And just that, that very fact of your everyday life means that you touch between 40 and 60 other lives that are held in situations of servitude, forced labor, exploitation. So just let that settle for a minute. That, that's how far and wide this issue has gone. Now in the UK, we, we have come a long way. If I go back to 2010, and Elizabeth, you'll, you'll know this, this was nowhere on the political agenda. The Human Trafficking Foundation that Elizabeth is a part of it, uh, through Anthony Steen, got the Anti-Slavery Day uh, inaugurated, and, that, and that's carried on, that's October the 18th. But when I reflect on where we've come from in the last eight years, I remember having a conversation with officials in the Home Office in 2010, 2011. And they said to me, there is no chance of legislation. There is no chance of a commissioner. There is no chance of transparency in supply chains. There is no chance of better care for victims and children. There is no chance of a helpline. And I take great pleasure in reminding the Home Office that at the moment I'm six for six in terms of a success rate. But in terms of what do you and I have to do, we have to make choices. We have to make choices about the way that we consume. We have to make choices about whether we will be the eyes and the ears and the voice for those that have no voice. Now in the UK now, uh, Unseen run the UK's Modern Slavery Helpline. In the last two years we took 10,000 calls identifying 12,000 potential victims in the United Kingdom, leading to modern slavery cases being taken up by every single police force in the UK, which is 45 different police forces, and cases taken up by the National Crime Agency that have gone around the globe. So it's an issue that's real and it's an issue so that's present. So it led present. to how many arrests, arrests of slavers, yeah, of traffickers? Because this is the real thing. It's what you want. You call a helpline because you want to say your case and you want the guy arrested, if yeah. possible. Yes, and, and the problem that we've got is that we're not, you know, the systems don't interlink. And, and that goes all the way through, you know. And we all know the problems of 43 different police forces, 43 different IT systems, and they don't talk to each other. Well, if, if I tell you the journey of, of one case that came through the helpline, this may explain the complications. So we had a call that came in from Cheshire of a victim. Now that victim called seven times. Why did he call seven times? Because he was building the trust with us in order that he could say, can you come and get me from this situation? The, mo the moment he then asked, we informed Cheshire Police. Cheshire Police went in, extracted that individual from a situation of forced criminality and forced labor. They were then referred into the national referral mechanism, and then purely by chance, they were placed in one of our shelters. Now, there are multitude, multitudinal different levels of systems that that person goes through, and none of them are linked. And yesterday, I chaired a meeting of uh, all major policing, uh, government, uh, and other agencies around how do we get the data to join up so I can answer your question, because at the moment, I can't answer your question. But when it comes to prosecutions, what I do see is that the people that we do end up usually prosecuting, certainly across Europe, are the low-level uh, exploiters and, and not those that are further up. And you're dealing with a very sophisticated uh, model. And I think one of the ways to understand modern slavery is how do we define it? There is no legal definition of modern slavery. In the UK, it's an umbrella term for forced labor, for uh, servitude, for slavery itself. But one way to think about this is that what we're talking about is an illicit trade, and it's a commodity trade. And the commodity is a human being, and that human being is bought and sold and exploited repeatedly. And Monique's right, and with very little chance of the perpetrators being caught, let alone being prosecuted. But why does that trade exist? It exists primarily because we have created a society that demands cheap. 
cheap goods, cheap services, and cheap labor. And that has partly been driven over the last 40 years by globalization. And it is also driven by an extractive profit model of capitalism, which is looking to extract as much profit from the equation, and it creates the environment where forced labor, where corners get cut. So actually, whilst talking about modern slavery, there are big structural issues that we need to address. And your question was, how do we do it as individuals? Well, we, we're eyes and ears, we report. I would encourage you to call the helpline. If you've got a smartphone, you can download the helpline app and report that way. If someone's in immediate danger, you re report to the police. But it's also about our choices as, as individuals. What questions do we ask of the companies that we purchase from? What questions are you going to ask when you leave Oxford, when you go and work for a company? You know, what is your stance on these issues? What are the individual choices that you will make in life in that whole process? So can I jump in and, and, um, and just tell you a story, a real story. So a man that I've come to know very well, uh, his name is Dipendra Giri, he, he lived in Nepal, he lives still in Nepal. Uh, he was 25 when he got married, he was um, very well educated because he speak a very correct English. He, he was a teacher and he knew how to use computers in his village. But then he gets married, he has a daughter, he was still living with his parents and grandparents, so he needs to make money for the family. So he takes an ad, uh, it's, a, it's a good job in Qatar, uh, uh, in an office where they would use his knowledge of English, etc., and computer. So he takes it, to take it, he has, of course, to sign a contract, and um, he signs the contract, and then to sign the contract, he has to go, he has to go to Kathmandu, it's costly, he has <laughs> then to take a ticket for Qatar, so it's all in all $1,200. Of course, he has not a penny, so he finds someone who gives him a loan, and he signs a paper, a contract, a real contract for the loan. And then the, the same man comes in the evening and says, sorry, this was signed, but I need another signature here because your interest rate will be 60%. And he was relatively lucky to have 60% because I've seen cases in India where it is 300%. So anyway, he, 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 he does everything he needs to do. He arrives in Qatar, is put on a construction site and is given dog food and he, he cannot leave. So here we have to speak of something that we could really act together to get eliminated. It is the kafala system. So I don't know how many of you in this room are aware of the kafala system. What is it? So no, it's very interesting. It's a system which exists in the Gulf region and in Lebanon and in Jordan and in many of the Middle East countries by which you, you, when you are employed by a company there, it is the owner of the company, it is the, the company that gives you the visa, the visa permit, that gives you the, the right to live there, and that gives you the permit to exit the country when you can exit the country. So Dipendra arrives in Qatar, immediately they take his passport because uh, they are the owner of the passport, and he stayed there eating dog food and having a terrible life for two years and a half when finally his grandmother was very sick and they give him a holiday to be able to go to fly and see his grandmother. So he goes there and of course never comes back. Uh, and his debt was growing of course. So he had to work again, go in the Gulf again, but not as a slave this time, but poorly paid, etc. And these debts, it's the whole system of debt bondage. And debt bondage is, the, is the, 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 the thing that makes slavery grow all the time. Because you are taken in sex trafficking. And I can speak of someone else, Marcella. She's Colombian. At some point in her life, she's like Dipendra. She needs absolutely to find a job. Someone tells her, I have a fantastic job for you in Japan. She goes to Japan, she's transformed into a prostitute. And the person that takes her to Japan says, you owe me 50,000 pounds. So to refund the 50,000 pounds, you have to work and sell your body for a number of times. 
two years in her case. But every time she was sick or every time she needed anything, it was adding to her debt. So everything you pay for your for, for eating, you pay for, so it adds to the debt. So the debt goes forever, etc. So this system of de debt bondage, this system of kafala, I think that if we are strong enough to really denounce it, and, and we do, uh, my, 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 the Thomson Reuters Foundation does, but uh, really acting on this to make change, it will change the life of s millions of people who come from India, who come from the Philippines, who come from everywhere, Sri Lanka, everywhere to work in the Gulf countries. Qatar, interestingly, I'm speaking of Qatar, but Qatar, interestingly, is the one which takes now action on this, and they have started to moderate the kafala system uh, and to, to try to stop this because they have the World Cup in 2022, I think, uh, and they know they better look not too bad uh, if they don't want to have the press of all over the world speaking of slavery. So they have started to get take real action, but the others don't. And the kafala system by which the company sponsors you to come and sponsors you to quit if you want to quit, is a system which is totally uh, unacceptable. Mm. So these are small things that we could do as uh, activists or as lawyers or as uh, people who are conscious of what is going on. So touching on sex trafficking, how can we reconcile the inevitable conflict between uh, forced sex sexual exploitation and voluntary sex work? Is that ever an issue that you sort of come to? Well, for years, uh, the prosecutors didn't know that uh, sex trafficking existed. It's very recent that we know. And so, uh, you know, you have someone like Cyrus Vance. Cyrus Vance is the Manhattan district attorney, the prosecutor for New York. And he was telling me that for the first 20 years of his career, when he had a prostitute in front of him, and in, in, in the US, you you, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not allowed by law to be a prostitute, so it's not the client, it's the, pro the prostitute which is a, a, making a crime. So when he was judging pros uh, prostitutes, he, he would never think that the, the, they would have been trafficked and they were doing that against their will. Then now, since 10 years, because we have shed so, more, so much light on this issue and everywhere, that now prosecutors start to know much better their job, more or less, and start to pay attention to the vocabulary. Is she terrorized? Is she, you know, obviously beaten, scarred? Because, you know, you cannot imagine the number of survivors I've seen with cigarettes burns all the time, everywhere on their body, uh, tattoo branded. I mean, the brand of the, 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 the trafficker on their forehead or on their neck, or, you know, like, uh, like the, the Nazis uh, at the time. This is uh, something which is very, very, um, very much happened. So if you see someone with tattoos which are really bizarre, you can really wonder too. It's a, it's a good sign, it's a good way to recognize uh, someone who has been trafficked. So it, it, it's very different. S sex workers, it's, you choose it, it's fine, as long as you don't fall in the hands of criminals. Uh, uh, trafficked for sex, for the first thing they do, the, the slavers, and I've just written a book that I will publish in October, in, in next October in, in US and UK. Speaking of cases, I mean, it's, it's the survivors who speak, uh, and um, uh, you, you are forced, you are beaten, you are raped. Rape is a constant form of slavery, uh, even for forced labor, uh, on boats, you know, Take Myanmar, very, very poor country too. Eh? You, you are a man, you want to, to work and, and feed your family. You have to, you are offered a job in Thailand to cut the trees in Thailand. You go to Thailand because you, you come from a country which has no sea, you don't see it, so you are used to that. You go to do that. But when you arrive, they push you on a boat and you go for nine months in a row fishing as a slave, not paid, beaten, etc. But on top of that, because the way to dominate a slave and make it obedient, because a rebellious slave is not a good business proposition, of course, so you, ha you have to really kill all their will and everything. 
the men on these boats are also raped. So it's not only in sex trafficking, it's in forced labor. And so many cases of forced labor was you, you also have this terrible thing of rape to dominate someone and subjugate him or her. If I could go back to what could we all do, I think the first thing is you've come tonight. And that is very good indeed, because you are now hearing about what goes on. So please, when you leave tonight, will you take your, tell your friends, your relatives, and anyone else you know that this exists, that it's on the streets, it's here in Oxford, it's everywhere. And can I just remind you of the girls at Rotherham, Rochdale, and Oxford. Those girls were groomed, weren't they? But they were then taken to hotels where the doors were locked and they were constantly raped. They became sex slaves. They weren't just being groomed for the boyfriend and so on, they actually moved into being trafficked from wherever they were into the hotels or the other places. And nobody in Oxford, the police, no one, nobody in Rotherham, and nobody in Rochdale over 15 years actually listened to them or to their parents. Yeah. And that's what goes on. So go away at the end of today and talk about this, please. Sa Sa Sarah was a, 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 a person who spoke at, at the conference last year. So she's from Southwest England. And she, she, she had a family disaster. She was put in foster care. And at 10, she was very unhappy in the, in the foster care she was. And a man, really nice man, 50-something, uh, really takes her in pity, give her sweets uh, for two years, really nice, take her on rides with his car, etc. cetera. Uh, at 12, he says now, you know, everything we have done for you, you owe us 75,000 pounds. She's white English person. She's 12. So she said, well, I don't have any money, of course I can't. Okay, so you are going to help me now and you are going to sell drugs. She started to try to sell drugs, but she was terrorized because it was a word that really terrorized her. So she, didn't, she could not do it. So they said, okay, so you are going to be sold to people. So she, she was raped between the age of 12 to the age of 19 when she escaped <coughs> every day. Eight, between eight and 15 times, she says. And she was going to school. Nobody noticed that she was completely exhausted every morning. Nobody, she went once for a trip in France with the school for one week. And nobody noticed that she was not in her bed that, all these nights. So it's a failure from all social services in the UK that could not address the, the, the problems of, of Sarah. And she's still with massive problem because when you get out of that, you have complex PTSD, so mental health, which is a huge issue. Nobody, can, nobody knows very well the problems of slaves, etc. So it's also a big, big issue how you recover your mental health after such a treatment for so many years. This is South England. Andrew, what about your films? Films? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are multiple ways in, in terms of, of educating people. There, there are loads of films online that you can access. There's, uh, my friend Julie Ormond's here. She's just uh, produced a film uh, called Ghost Ship. Uh, you, can, you can go and see these films. But what I would also say is bring this always back to individuals like Sarah. We, we have the incredible privilege of working with the victim, we call them survivors, that are found in the United Kingdom. And they, we work with the most complex cases that are found in the UK. So we, we have a 24-7 specialist shelter with specialist teams working with them. You know, if someone presents with PTSD now, we go, that's normal. But that tells you where we're at in terms of the, the barbarity and the brutality that these survivors encounter. And the issue is that exploiters prey on the vulnerable. And you may be sitting in here in Oxford thinking, well, I'm not vulnerable. 
but take away the roof over your head, take away community and take away a job, and an exploiter will prey on you. Take away that need for belonging and acceptance and love, an exploiter will prey on you. And Elizabeth's right, you know, as I was walking around Oxford today, I was reminded of the case in Oxford. I was also reminded of, you know, the fact that we've had hundreds of calls in the Thames Valley area, that Thames Valley police are seeing such an uptick in terms of the prevalence of exploitation across the, the force area. And so it is very much an issue that is hidden in plain sight. You, you can walk past it and not see it. And so actually by coming here and making yourself aware, if you begin to understand what the indicators are, and then you do something that is very un-British, you, you pick up a phone or you, or you report it, you might be that one chance that that individual has in order to escape that, that place of, of exploitation. And in case you think, you know, this is, a, oh, this is an issue that's of the other, it's not. Last year in the UK, Elizabeth said, you know, it was 5,134 victims went into the national referral mechanism. With, within adults, we saw 102 different nationalities. UK citizens were fifth. With kids, UK citizens were first. It's a growing problem that we are uncovering in the UK, let alone around the globe. And it is a vast trade in commodities to be exploited. And why do people do it? Fundamentally, it's the money. Whether it's sexual exploitation or forced it's labor greed, exploitation. Greed, it greed. Is, it is money. And control. India, every day, in a rape case, in every day. Every day, uh, that means uh, not only girl child, no age bar, five years, four years, child to and a 72 years old lady. This is modern slavery. I'm in Hindi. I'm talking about my language in Hindi. I'm talking about my language in Hindi. I'm talking about my Hindi. Puri India me, me rape case ke liye kam kar rahe I'm working for rape victim and inquiry for the case. So many hundred hundred cases in India. Actually, rape kyu ho raha hai? India is rape. the biggest country for slavery in the world. Slavery, right? Fifteen slavery, million. Modern slavery, not in industries. Ita ita factory re hoji. इतना फैक्ट्री हो चुकी था ना इतना फैक्ट्री एक एक इतना फैक्ट्री में महिला को रेप हो रहा है ये सिर्फ फैक्ट्री पे नहीं हो रहा है ये हर जगह हो रहा है हर जगह रेप हो रहे एवरी डे चार साल बच्चे के साथ हो रहे सेवेंटी टू इयर्स उइमेन के साथ हो रहे दिस इज़ द ग्रेट प्रॉब्लम इन इंडिया इसलिए हो रहे हैं इसलिए हो रहा है तो मेन एक्चुअली माइंड सेट तो इमेन माइंड से जी मेन पर्सन के माइंड सेट ये चेंज नहीं हो रहा है इसलिए हो रहे हैं the rapes the rapes are happening in India you know a four year old kid kid is raped and a seventy two year old woman is raped so age has nothing to do with the rape cases in India it's mainly happening because the male perception is not changing it's you know we still the culture in India is quite patriarchal no actually respect नहीं कर रहे कोई जो culture है वो बचपन से सिखाना चाहिए तो ये वीमेन है ये गर्ल चाइल्ड है ये गर्ल चाइल्ड इक्वल टू मेन चाइल्ड there is a lot of lack of awareness in India because what you know she is trying to say is where people should actually educate their boys to respect women. You know that doesn't happen and it's always a pressure on women to act according to the whims of the men. तो लोग चाहते हैं जो महिला है ना वो काम करेगी सिर्फ घर में काम करेगी वो बच्चा पैदा करेगी Women are still treated as factories to give birth to kids. In rural area, people think that women will only work, will work at home, and will give birth to children, like a machine. And I think what we've highlighted across the panel. That's why the problem is that 
तो महिला के लिए सम्मान नहीं जो सम्मान मिलना चाहिए वो सम्मान नहीं होती है वो बिना सम्मान में कोई भी मन में क्या आती है वो रेप हो जाती है रेप मीन्स इस सीरियस रेप जिससे मॉडर्न स्लेबरी हर जगह होती है नॉट इंडस्ट्रीज Um, and I think what we've highlighted sort of across the panel is that it's a global issue and that in, as individuals we can tackle it and sort of individual governments can tackle it. And before we move on to sort of questions from the audience, what do you think can be done at an international level through institutions like the UN? Well, the, the SDG goals say that slavery will be finished in 2030. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. But what do you think they can practically do to help sort of governments maybe implement The legislation well, like the 2015. First, you know, you have good laws which have no teeth. Yeah. Because this is the reality of that law. So, if you were giving teeth to that law, but it would mean that you would have to appoint prosecutors, you would have to appoint, you know, uh, many people in the justice system which today uh, are not here yes. in the UK. Uh, and the same and the same in every country. I mean, India is the first country for slaves in the world. And when you see uh, the dimension of the issue, it's colossal. So the, the only Nobel Prize that has been given to someone who deals with slavery is uh, to Kailash Satyarthi. And Kailash Satyarthi is someone I know very Chinese well. And Chinese. I had the privilege to spend three days in his China. ashram with him and yeah. with all the children he rescued from slavery. Children who have been taken at five or six years old who have been, uh, you know, treated like, <coughs> like, but worse than commodities, beaten, uh, beaten with a hammer on their fingers. I mean, you see horrors. And, and, and this is in India today. Uh, and, and they have still 14 million slaves, probably a lot, lot more. But not only children, a lot of men that too, in forced labor. Can, can I, Kola Satati working for children. Kola Satati working for children. Yeah. The specialist. But for one the quarter of the slaves in the world are children, according to the IAEA. Yeah. We're going to move to some questions from the audience now. Uh, would anyone in the audience like to ask a question to anyone on the panel or to the panel as a whole? Can we take the woman in the front row, please? Just wait for Mike to come to you. Um, hi, thank you for your interesting talk. Um, I'm just trying to understand the dynamics between um, putting the responsibility, not putting the responsibility, but asking individuals to partake in this or um, having stricter laws. Because in a lot of cases, obviously this is a very small bubble and people are selfish. I, that's what personally what I think. So it's very difficult to ask people to be aware of modern slavery. It's very difficult to sort of um, put the responsibility on people because it doesn't really go anywhere from that. Um, so don't you think that we sort of, the focus should be on, I don't know, big corporations, like I have an iPhone and obviously, you know, I have clothes that are probably being made by slaves. Um, I don't know how to stop that, even though I would really like to and not partake in this. Um, it's very difficult for individuals to do that. Do you, do you see where I'm coming from? Um, yeah, I think- how do, it, we, how do we change it, that? It's both a top down and a bottom up. <laughs> movement that, that needs to happen. So the, the first thing is we're not going to prosecute our way out of this problem. Um, you know, Monique mentioned that you know, 70% of the identified uh, number of potential slaves in the, in the globe are in forced labor situations. That means they're in the supply chains of the global corporations, usually near the bottom of those supply chains. So yes, we need smart legislation that encourages companies to do the right thing. Now, I come from a, a, a corporate background uh, originally. The problem that we have to address is a structural problem, which is around the issue of procurement. If you're a procurer or a buyer, it, it, and it doesn't really matter what the business is, you are incentivized on one thing and one thing alone, and that is the profit margin. And so you would drive the profit margin down that supply chain, and that creates the structural problems that then allows for exploitation to take place. So we need to be smart in how we legislate companies to do the right thing. And then we have two options. We can either say, well, we're going to name and shame the bad actors. But I, having sort of raised three kids, I know that naming and shaming doesn't work at an individual level and it doesn't really work at a corporate level. Ah, and, it and works completely. I totally disagree. Hang on, let me finish, Monique. And I will tell you why. No, Monique, let me finish. <laughs> What we should be focusing on is naming and shaming those companies that are dealing with it. 
And what do we mean by dealing with it? Well, first and foremost, and, and when I talk at business conferences, I say, look, we're all guilty. That's not the issue. What I want to know as an NGO leader is what are you doing to find these issues? What are the structural things in your company that you're doing to, to look for these issues? And start reporting what you're finding and learning from it in that whole process. Now in the UK, when we passed transparency in supply chain and we followed from California, what it was requiring companies to do was say, what are all the steps that you're taking? The sad fact is three years on, only about 56% of the 18,000 organizations that should be reporting are reporting. And Elizabeth you know, alluded to why there's problems around that, and I'm really looking forward to what the review comes forward with in terms of encouraging companies. But what we need is, is this behavioral change within the capitalist model. We, we need companies to realize that they are to be a force for good in society and not just about extracting profit for the benefits so, of shareholders. So if I can, can jump we just, in. Can we just go to Elizabeth just quickly first just, and then we'll go to okay. Mark. I just wanted to say there's another area that needs to be explored and that's prevention. And some very good work has been done in a particular state of Nigeria, uh, Edo state, to try and get work for the girls there so they don't come over and become sexually exploited. They've also been doing work in Vietnam because a lot of Vietnam boys come over and actually manage cannabis plants in rented accommodation. I hope your families don't find themselves um, renting out to a cannabis farm because they actually um, take everything on the ground floor and they subvert the electricity and the water, the boys are locked in. So the work has been done at the moment in Vietnam to stop Vietnamese children. And that is the sort of very good prevention work that we should be widening to a very large extent. Yeah. So to come back on that, the reason I, I don't agree on there is no use in shaming and blaming is that we have uh, created the Stop Slavery Award three years ago. Many very big corporations have been candidate, from Apple to Thai Union to Unilever to uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They have to fill a very long questionnaire when they are candidate. And we see exactly why and what they do. And uh, I can tell you that most of them, and I'm speaking of more than 50 big companies, most of them have started to really pay attention after, to, to do their supply chain after media attention, after media either show, showed wrongdoing in their, in their direct production line or because media showed that there was big problems in this industry. And I'm speaking of chocolate and, and, and Ivory Coast and et cetera, et cetera. And they have started to act together to, to really address this issue. And I've seen very big corporations put millions and millions of dollars to try to clean their sub -branches. So they do it. It's always come from the top. It's really interesting. So you are going to work in these corporations. And it's really good that you are aware and you know that corporations can also be a force for good if they want. I will just give the, the, the names of the, 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 the winners of the Stop Slavery Award last year. It was Adidas. Adidas was the overall winner because this is a company which knows each supplier to the second tier of the supply chain. It's extraordinary the amount of effort and money they put uh, to address this issue. Um, the other winners were also consumer group CNA, uh, which is a, a retailer, uh, COP in the UK, the COP, very good. And uh, what was the fourth one? I've forgotten. It, it was Intel, uh, a technology company. The year before, it was also two technology company, but it's easier for a technology company than for a retailer or for Walmart or for uh, uh, who have so many suppliers around the world. But the fact that you show wrongdoing force them to act immediately because they are, they, they are, if they have a brand reputation, a damage to their brand, they will act immediately. If a government take a law, it will take years of efforts to have the law voted, then it will take years to have it implemented, and it will take years to give it teeth when finally <laughs> you will have given teeth to that law. 
So, so corporations can act very quickly, and they are allies in that fight, and they really can be big allies. So pay attention to the companies you are going to work for. I think we have time for one more question. Could we take the hand in the second row? Hi, thank you for the um, very um, illustrative panel. Um, my name is Sandra Fischer-Martens. I'm a co-founder of the Symmetry Fund. We're launching an impact fund that works with um, NGOs, human rights NGOs, to uncover companies that are worst offenders in the modern slavery and environmental sectors and take bets against them in the stock market. That means that we'll be using financial, classical financial tools to uh, name and shame. So it's a much more uh, a stick than a carrot approach. Um, I've heard that some of you are more <laughs> stick, some are more carrot, but I would like to know if given the sense of urgency that we're all getting, for instance, from the latest, I know it's not your issue exactly, but environmental uh, issues from the latest does climate change report and what's happened also in forced labor feel? Do you think that given this sense of urgency, it's more appropriate to start using <coughs> stick? Are there more people out there using stick or are we still going to go slowly, slowly and for how long with carrot approaches? I, I think you need a spiky carrot. <laughs> so, listen, it's taken us 40 years to get into the mess that we have through globalization, and not just with slavery and forced labor exploitation, but also around environmental damage and, and sustainability. It is probably going to, let's be real, it's going to take us another 40 years to get out of this mess. The point of a spiky carrot is, is you, you reward good behavior, but for those, and I do agree, I just, my pushback is when naming and shaming is, remains the controlling narrative, I don't think that fundamentally changes things. It just uh, creates a compliance mentality. And so what we want is a fundamental change within business and within corporations so that they are seen as for social good. That's why you see in the US the whole B-team organization, uh, it, it, you know, people like Pullman at uh, Unilever, Branson at Virgin and others saying actually w there is a responsibility that businesses have. Absolutely. You know, wh when you go out into the workplace, what questions are you going to ask of your future employers? When you consume, what do you ask? And, and how do you ask it? Now, I can tell you as a former retailer that you can affect change as an individual. You can have far more uh, impact in just the language and the nuance of how you ask those questions. So I've been in meetings where the stance was, I've got a baseball bat and I've got a grenade and the pin's out, can we talk? It's not, it's not going to be a beautiful relationship. You can still have honest and hard, fast conversations with people you know, about the, the really nitty gritty stuff, but I just think we need to get smarter at how we do it so that we can see societal shifts. Now, Deloitte University did a study because Deloitte in the US discovered that they weren't able to hire the brightest and the best. And they wanted to know why that was the case. And their attrition rate in terms of staff was going through the roof. And they went and asked it. And the response was, you as a business have nothing to say about sustainability, about the environment, about slavery. And until you do, we won't even look at you and consider you as an employee. So as an individual, you have huge responsibility and huge choices. And, and you, you have that not only for slavery, but really for many things. Uh, you know, uh, law firms, we, we work with many, many law firms, of course, around the world. What they were telling me is that when uh, now, so they all poach for the best students, of course, because they want the best uh, in the US or in the UK, it's very competitive between law firms. Uh, and, and they say the differentiator is what we do and what we give back to society, because more and more the millennials is the first thing they ask when they have the choice between, I don't know, White and Case and Baker and McKenzie, they will ask, what do you do for, uh, to give back to society, etc. This is fantastic. This is what we should do in all, uh, in, in all or the corporation, the, the law firm, the whatever we are going to do, you are going to do in the future. This is a question to ask your employer. Absolutely. And ask it frequently and more and more frequently. Well, it's great to end on a positive note. We have to wrap up now. So can everyone join me in thanking our wonderful panelists here? Thank you.